Stand up and say good morning to your neighbor.
going to do one we haven't done in a long time. Today, uh, our pianist is gone, our praise band pianist. So we do one that we think you can sing out really, really loud and uh, just worship the Lord with this morning. Uh, one of our favorites, All About God, God of Wonders. Lord of all creation, of water. Father God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. You are the God of wonders. You are um, everything that we could ever need. Our good Father, our um, just our help in troubled times, our um, giver of the freedoms that we have in this country and in this place. We pray for all the churches in our area and all over the world that are preaching the truth. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters who are in places where um, politically it's uh, illegal to be doing what we're doing today. And they're doing it in secret, and they would literally give their right pinky to be able to have just a page of the Bible. So help us not ever to take for granted this blessing that we have. Thank you for our brother Stacy, who's coming back today, coming home to give this message for homecoming. Thank you for everybody that's brought food and fellowship. And, oh, we're just so thankful to be here. We give it 
All glory and praise to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. All right, as we continue our time of praise this morning, anybody have anything they want to um, praise the Lord for today? Other than it's the 142nd annual or annual, buddy, I guess it is, birthday uh, for Plymouth Church, so we're very thankful to be celebrating homecoming. I know we have a lot of folks that are traveling. We have some folks that are in the mountains uh, doing some mission work and also doing stuff with their jobs. We want to remember them in prayer, but also praise for the opportunities that they have. Is there anybody who has something this week? Kelly. So everything that was collected for Abby to take the boon back to college meant to be a Jeep load, ended up being a trailer uh, plus load. So praise the Lord for that. Thanks, church, for stepping up. I know we've got uh, two or three people who haven't been to church in a while, so we're thankful that they're able to be here physically. So if that, I'm not going to single them out, but we, we've got some folks that are physically able to be here today. We have some other folks that came today because I wasn't preaching. So uh, I get it. I understand. I, I, I can live with that. And I uh, get to hear Stacy today, so we're thankful for that. Others have something good I want to praise the Lord for today. Yes, Julie. Very good. Got released from the physical, physical therapy this week. That's right. Yes, Miss Faye. Yes, I got a big praise report. What's that? My family's here. Got your whole family here. Very good. We're thankful for that. Kathy. We made it a year. The, the twins turned a year old today. Yes, had a big party and... That's always fun. Double the cake smashing in the face. Amen. <laughs> Miss Dolores. Yes. I, we finished the trip yesterday. Yes. Last week. And uh, I can hear Amen. Amen. Yes. I'm doing this on behalf of the She's waiting to share. And we're so proud of her. She was in her talent show at her school and performed in front of lots and lots of people. I saw that and knocked it out of the park. Got a little voice there, a booming voice. So she seems to be a little shy right now, but she didn't look shy when she got up there singing that song. So we're gonna get we'll get her up here some. I know she sang with the youth. Yeah, yeah. Youth directors already already bookmarked that uh, that video. All right, anybody else? All right, I want to thank everybody that came yesterday for the church beautification day, and so we're thankful for that. Also, if you're a guest here, first time guest. And you don't have a church home, we've got a welcome bags out there for you in front of you in your pew or your chairs, little welcome cards. We're not going to put you on a mailing list. We're not going to come knock on your door. We just want to know who you are and if there's any information you would like about the church, we would love to do that. A couple of things in regards to announcements. Um, you can look on the back and see today's the last day for deacon nominations. The little blue cards are out here in the hallway in what we call Grand Central Station. Immediately after the service, We'll give just a moment for people that have kids to go and get their kids, and then everybody can just go through this way and go to line up in the fellowship hall. The t-shirts that were ordered, we have those. They did come in, and so they're lined up there, and we have a couple of ladies that are going to be there to distribute them and pay as you're picking them up. We also ordered some extras, so if you didn't get one or you want another one, you can also do that as well. Baptism is coming up in two weeks. We've got at least five right now that are confirmed for that. All the way, I think, from like uh, sixth, uh, seventh grade all the way into somebody in their 40s. So if you're interested in that, Lord's leading that on your heart, please talk to me soon. Trunk or Treat, you see there, big event in the life of our church, big outreach, invite people. There's donations for candy back there, as well as the Operation Christmas Child. You see the church conference coming up. The quilt that was made will be for the harvest sale, the auction sale. That All the proceeds are going to uh, Crossing All Borders Ministry in Anger which is doing a lot right now with hurricane relief, but since stuff all over the world. We've had everybody from our little kids to our senior adults go over there and help pack different things at different times. And then we still do have the list of the disaster relief. I want to give you a little update about that. Um, first of all, we have a mission team going out for our church internationally that are going to be going to Nicaragua to partner with our missionaries in, there in Nicaragua, Sunica on October the 22nd through the 26th, and there's five of them. I don't think they're all here because somebody, I know Miss Patty and uh, Emily had a family commitment that they were at, but the three that are here, would you just stand? 
This is Dagny and Amy and Heather. They're going to be representing. So be in prayer for them. So thank you. We will. Um, we certainly will be in prayer. And I'll ask Brother Donald if he will uh, add that to our prayer time today. Also, we've had about 30 of you sign up to want to go and do disaster recovery and things down uh, in the up east, uh, up west. Excuse me. And Baptist on Mission and Samaritan's Purse are the two organizations that are really on the front lines down there, and you've seen that even on the news. And Baptist on Mission is not even taking applications right now. They have so many that they've shut the link down because they're booked out for so far. So I'm going to be looking at a, <clears throat> another alternative, not that we won't ever partner with them, but I'm hoping to go the end of this week with the Raleigh Baptist Association uh, director and go down. He's been able to connect with some churches and some pastors and communities that are still cut off. They're only able to get supplies by gators and heavy equipment and four-wheelers going over creeks and stuff like that to get to these folks. And so I'm going to go down and pray. I've got some stuff that was given after the deadline. My office is full of stuff right now. And I'm going to go down there, and we're going to see if the Lord leads, if I can meet a pastor down there. Maybe we can adopt a church even or a community and make this a long-lasting relationship. It's great that Baptist on Mission have so many volunteers, but... This is going to be a long haul. This is going to be a year-long process uh, at least. And so I'm hoping that Plymouth can send people regularly and do that here in our home state and really be the hands and feet of Christ to those people who are hurting. So I hope that makes sense. So if you haven't gotten a call yet, just we understand that. Just wait a little bit longer. We will be giving you a text or a call as soon as we find out some information. All right, this time we're going to dismiss the Children to Children's Church, and Pastor Matthew has a ministry highlight. So, children, you can be dismissed. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, I don't know if many of you know what uh, what month this is. I know you what, what day this is. This is Homecoming Sunday for Plymouth Church, but... Um, for this month, um, I know in Southern Baptist, uh, in Southern Baptist life, uh, we celebrate Pastor Appreciation Month in the month of October. And so I would uh, actually like to call Chris back up here again. <laughs> I know um, the short time that I've been here. I just told Stacy I was done for the day. I was relaxing. <laughs> um, I know that for the short time that I've been here, I've just seen how much uh, this church loves their pastor, um, and it's uh, it's one of, it's made me want to do this. So I wanted to present a gift from the uh, children's ministry uh, to Thank Pastor you. Chris, um, and if you want to, you can bring him cakes, and then he can just leave them in my office because uh, I know I know he won't eat them. I'm just kidding, uh, but we just want to thank uh, Pastor thank Chris for much. what he's done. So. morning. Got several things going on in, in the life of the church and we want to say a prayer of thanks for, for all that. We want to continue to pray for folks in, in western North Carolina uh, with what they're dealing with. We want to also pray for folks in Florida that, that were hit with not just Helene but also Milton that came through there. Uh, but uh, we've got a lot of things going on here in our community and we'll go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again uh, for the opportunity to come out, not, not just to your house again on a Sunday morning, but to come out to another homecoming Sunday and, and celebrate another year in the life of Plymouth Church and what it has meant uh, in this community and what it has also meant um, in spreading your gospel. And we hope that we continue, as long as you tarry, to continue to be a, a place where the gospel can be spread and dispersed in this community. And we hope that you come and linger with us uh, so that we can be and, and continue to be profitable servants to you. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the people who give their tithes and offerings to Plymouth so that we continue to do all the work, whether that's uh, the regular ministry work that we do here or in Sunday school or in our foreign missions, and we're thankful uh, for all the gifts that people give uh, here to Plymouth. We're also thankful for the opportunity to have a foreign mission 
uh, that not only do we support them, but we have people actually actively going to do work with some of those missions down in Nicaragua later on this month. We want to pray for those five people that will be going from Plymouth down there that not only will uh, they do your work, but they'll also have good experience and learn and bring back knowledge to carry more people down there in the future, Heavenly Father. Be with us as we go and celebrate another Homecoming Sunday, uh, and be with us in a couple of weeks as we have a Baptism Sunday, and perhaps even more people will come and have their public profession of faith. Be with our guest uh, speaker today, and have your words be his words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The opening hymn this morning is To God Be the Glory. Please stand as we sing. Good morning. So your bulletin says that there's a soloist, but because it's homecoming, it's been a lot of years, but I asked my dad if he would sing a song um, with me that we used to sing a long time ago, and he graciously agreed, so I hope you're blessed by it. Thank you. 
And you know, I like to talk a lot. Chris, give me two minutes. <laughs> so it's going to start now. I want to introduce our speaker today. Stacy is what I call my miracle child. Hey, Stacy. My miracle child. When he was four years old, he was diagnosed with leukemia. And that lasted for just a hard, hard journey for five years. And God decided he didn't, he wasn't ready for Stacy yet. So. He left them here with us, and that's why I want to introduce our speaker today, my son, Stacy Betts. Thank you, Thank you. 
Am I on back there? Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Mama. That was beautiful. Um, first of all, it's good to be back. Uh, I know there are a lot of faces here I do not recognize. There are a lot that I do. And I want to tell you a little bit about my time here at this church before we get started uh, with the message that um, God's put on my heart today. And I also want to thank Royal and Jana for a beautiful, beautiful song. So thank you for that. But before I get started, I can't do what I'm about to do without the Lord's help. So if you would just go with me, uh, bow your head for a moment of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this time to be back in this church, which brings so many great memories for me. I grew up here, uh, was introduced to you here, and Lord, it's just meant so much to me over my, my lifetime. And so, Father, as I open up your pages this morning, have a few moments to share, I pray, Father, above all, that you're glorified, that you're honored, that your spirit would fill me, work through me, speak to the hearts and souls of every person here. You have a word for everybody here today. So I pray we hear it, and Lord, that we just uh, continue to fall in love with you every day. We praise you, we love you for what you do and what you continue to do in our life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background for me here, why this is so special, and to come back here for homecoming is very unique for me. I grew up going to church here. Um, we laugh all the time. We had a drug problem in our family. Mom drug us to church all the time, Plymouth Church. So we came here a lot. I heard the gospel preached here over and over. Uh, Pastor Woodall was here a few weeks ago. Uh, David Huckleby was a guy that I went up to when I was 13 years old. I said, David, there is a hole in my heart. <clears throat> and I know the only one that can fill it is Jesus. So at age 13, I gave my life to Christ. My dad, at about 51 years of age, nothing to do with church, became a Christian. Started coming here to Plymouth. Died just a few years later. He's buried right across the street. My mom's been here for over 40 years. I grew up with Pastor Chris, who I have a great, great respect for. Uh, our youth group was a whopping six people. Stephen Porter, Michelle Jones, Ryan Jones, Dawn Davis, Adana Bailey. They may be here. Dawn may be here somewhere. If I saw David, there she is. We had a six people, seven. I don't know how many it was, but it was small, less than ten. But we have a special bond today that still goes. I will tell you something about your pastor uh, my wife and I celebrated our 28th wedding anniversary last Saturday, and I proposed to her in February of 1996 at Johnson, Lake Johnson here, and I had Chris, who my wife had met once before, ask if he would come and sing a song and do an interpretive dance <laughs> so I would, could propose to my wife. So he, he sang Pretty Young Thing with Michael Jackson. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He sang a Vince Gill song, um, and then I bowed, on, or got down on one knee and uh, proposed to my wife. She said yes, thankfully. And then Chris sang that song by Vince Gill, Look at Us, in our wedding uh, in October of 1996. And I know you and Don got, I think, married just a year later. So, great love for this man. I've been to a number of homecomings here, a number of harvest sales here. I think this is the first one I've had a chance to come speak. So that's why it's so special to me. I wanted you to have a little bit of background about me, what this church has meant to me in my life. I also want to say thanks for my family coming, pretty much everybody. And then my football coaches back here, Coach Gray, Coach Smith, and Coach Stewart. Thank you. You guys mean the world to me, and you know that. So with that, I'll stop trying to get emotional, but you can tell how special this place is to me. And I get a little bit excited when I speak. Just don't get in the front row too close because you might get a little bit of spit every now and then. But that's the football coach in me. That's the sports guy in me. I'm right now I'm a part of a ministry called Sports Mission Outreach where we go out and we work with local high schools, public and private. And we specifically work with student athletes and coaches on football on a given Friday. We're somewhere in about eight to ten schools doing pregame devotions. I was at Garner this week. Um, I go to Millbrook, Leesville Road. We go to Sanderson. We go to a lot of schools. And we're out trying to just share the gospel for as long as we can. And those doors are open. And that's a passion that I have, and it's a way to mix faith and sports together. But why am I here today? I've messaged something today titled, Eyes Up and Kingdom Down. And let me tell you why I did this. 
the Lord put this on my heart, and I want to go ahead and tell you, if you have your Bible, please go ahead and turn to Psalm 145. Just go ahead and get there. If you don't have your Bible and you have your phone, turn to Psalm 145. We're going to be reading out the English Standard Version. I will have the verses on the screen. You can follow along, but if you're like me and I'm in the back, there's no way I could see the print. So again, I encourage you to get your phone or your Bible out. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 145, and we're going to talk about that today and why I've messaged this eyes up and kingdom down. Now let me say this, and I'm going to speak real truth to everybody in here, and when I say this to you all, I say this to me as well. There are some people here today that hide and mask better than others the challenges and cert, uh, uncertainties that we have in life. Some of you are really good at hiding it. We wouldn't know anything's going on in life. But here's what I know. 100% of the people in here have issues and challenges you face. 100%. For some of us, it's sudden. It comes up on, up on us like this. For others, it happens over time. Maybe it's over weeks, months, years, maybe decades, but it happens to every single one of us. And when I think about where my attention goes when those things come up, what we're going to talk about today is our attention first should go up so that we can have a kingdom down view on life and everything we face. But too often, like me, our attention goes out on the things that we face. And it's not to minimize the things. Matter of fact, here's what I would share with you. In other words, as a, as a church and as a people, we're consumed with depression, guilt, pain, hurt, unforgiveness, relational strain, marital strain, financial hardship, physical sickness, mental sickness, spiritual dryness, doubts, fears, worries, purposelessness, identity crisis, loneliness, fear of elections, fears and stress of the economy, natural disasters, wars, terrorism, Violence, you could go on and on and on. We face it, and some hide it better than others, but we all have it. We're a broken country, full of broken people, and we need hope. Because of this, so much of our focus, understandably so, is spent looking out every day instead of looking up. So I simply want to say this this morning, and I want to challenge us as a congregation and as people here, this morning, I want to say eyes up. Because here's what I know. For the next few moments, I want to talk about the hope we have in Jesus, the hope for today, tomorrow, next week, and next year, and the hope we have for eternity. And here's what I want you to think about. When we look up, our perspective changes because of time with the King. When we look up, our confidence changes because of time with the King. When we look up, our purpose changes because of time with the King. When we look up, our prayers change because of time with the King. When we look up, we begin to change because of time with the King. My situation may not change. My circumstances may not change, but I do. Why? Because of time with the King. Time focused with Jesus in worship, in adoration, is the, capital T, capital H, capital E, the first priority. And it is saying to God, you are most important right now. And you are most important in all of my life. When we look to Him first, and I start with you first, then I look at what's around me, in front of me, behind me. But I start with my eyes up on you first so that I can see life and all its challenges, kingdom down, Holy Spirit filled, confident and assured that you've got me and that you've got this. This is why we're going to talk about Psalm 145 today. And if I were to say, this is my life and this is what I'm going through and there's a blank you can fill in the blank with whatever that is. I just listed out a bunch of stuff, but there's a blank that you're filling in. Everybody right now, if you think about what you're going through, fill it in with that thing or those things that are constantly having you look out. And understandably so, that's what I want you to focus on as we go through Psalm 145 today. And here's what I'll tell you. I love what David does in Psalm 145 because he helps us understand how to look up. And there are many examples of Scripture of people who looked up. And I want to focus on what David did today in Psalm 145. So if you're ready, say go. Are you ready? Say go. All right, let's go. So here's what I've got. Here's the main point of what we're going to talk about today. Consistently worshiping and praising God for who He is and what He does, past, present, and future. Centers our hearts and minds on Jesus so we face life with a kingdom down perspective, purpose, and hope. And there's three points I want to share today. I'm going to go ahead and tell you what they are. In Psalm 145, there's three things we're going to look at. We're going to look at what David says about who God is. Then we're going to look at what David says about what he does. And because of one and two, 
we're going to see what David says. How should we respond? Not just David, but everyone in this room that's a follower of Jesus Christ. When we recognize who he is, when we recognize what he does, how should we respond? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a little bit of background and context because anytime we open up this book, we ought to be able to take a look ahead, a look beyond what's going on in the situation so we can understand what's happening in the context of what we're reading. So let me give you a bit of background of the book of Psalm. And some of you probably know pretty high level, but you might be surprised at some of the things about the book of Psalm. And here we go. It's a collection of prayers, of poems, hymns, and songs. And ancient Israel would use these to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. So think back hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, they were singing songs and using these psalms to worship. For private uh, devotion, for public worship, they would use them in religious festivals. But we use those today, right? I know I open up the psalm all the time. Many of you probably here do too. That's one of the first places you go just for praise and worship and adoration for our Heavenly Father. Now, many of you may say, well, I know who wrote the book of, of Psalm, and you'll probably say David. Well, he wrote part of the book of Psalm. I don't know if you know this, it took a thousand years to put that collection, of the book of Psalm, together. If you know the scriptures, there's 66 books. The book of Psalm is one of those 66. It has 150 chapters, the most chapters of any in all of scripture. The oldest of all those Psalms, the 150 Psalms, is Psalm 90, written by Moses. Did you know Moses wrote a Psalm? Many people didn't realize that. He did. He wrote one of the Psalms. It's believed to be one of the oldest. And it took those thousand years to compile it, and it was actually compiled about 500 years before Jesus was born. So the book of Psalm we have right here was written about 500 years, compiled about 500 years before Jesus was born. And here's the other thing. Don't lose sight that Jesus is threaded throughout all of Psalm. Matter of fact, if you look at uh, the book of Psalm in Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 22, 45, 72, and many others, they provide a picture of the Messiah, of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and his suffering and his reign. And what you may not know is that David actually wrote 73 of the 150 Psalms. That's 48%. The other 33% or 50 Psalms, we don't know who wrote them. So that leaves 19% for those of you who are great math majors that were written by people like Solomon, David's son and successor, by Moses, by the family of Asaph, and by the sons of Korah. And you may not know this either. The book of Psalm is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. It's quoted 116 times, and 25 of those refer to something about predicted nature of Christ's coming, 22%. So just some amazing things. So Jesus is woven throughout. David wrote a portion of almost 50%, and we're going to read one of those Psalms today. But here's the thing I want you to think about. David, what do we know about David and his life? And many of you know this stuff. You, you remember if you've been in church for a while, you know this, but some of you knew. I just want to kind of refresh this. What is his life like? Well, remember David, he was a shepherd boy. He was the killer of Goliath. He was a musician. He was the anointed king of Israel, the second king. He was a military hero. He was chased by King Saul, the first king. Then he would eventually become king after Saul died. He committed adultery. Then he led someone into murder, uh, Bathsheba's husband. There was rape and murder in his family. His son Absalom came after him to kill him, chased him. And then David, throughout all those ups and downs, he turned to God for hope, for strength, for purpose, forgiveness. And then ultimately know that through David, we are promised the Messiah, the everlasting King, and that's through Jesus. That's what we're talking about today. So I wanted to tee that up a little bit, give you some context of what we're reading, some background about Psalm 145. Is everybody good tracking with me so far? All good? Excellent, good. You can stand a little animated. I like that. I saw some responses with some thumbs up. Thank you for that. So here we go. I know this is small, but what I'm going to ask you to do, what I'm going to ask you to do is if you're able, I would ask you to stand because we're going to read these verses in Psalm 145 together. So if you would please stand. So Psalm 145, English Standard Version. I will extol you, my King and God. And remember, this is David writing. And bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and He has mercy, is mercy over all that He has made. 
All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you. Let me say that again. The eyes of all look to you. And give you, you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name. God bless his word. You can be seated. Thank you. So remember, what is our main point? We want to worship and praise God for who He is, for what He does, and then we're going to see what David says about how we respond. Now I want you to look, and again, I know it's hard to see, but just the idea, there are six verses in Psalm 145 that talk about who the Lord is. And I want you to look in those verses. Verse 3, verse 8, verse 9, verse 13, and then verse 17 and 18. And so I took those and I highlighted them in yellow, and then I'm going to collapse them into six verses. And I just want you to read with me for a second. Here's who David is saying the Lord is. He's saying, great is the Lord, verse 3. Verse 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love and steadfast love. Verse 9, the Lord is good to all. Verse 13, the Lord is faithful. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous. Verse 18, the Lord is near. Six references. And so when I started to think about that, it reminded me in the book of John, do you remember when Jesus gave seven I am statements about himself? He said, I am the bread of life, the light of, world, the light of the world. I am the door, the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection, the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true vine. I started to think about that. So there's seven I am statements in the book of John. And then here, right here in Psalm 145, we see six the Lord is statements. And while we don't have time to go through all six of these, I'm going to pick one. The one that sets the tone for the rest of this chapter that we're reading today, the 21 verses, and here it is, verse 3. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, His greatness is unsearchable. Think about this for a minute. Three times he mentions the word great. What do you think the theme here is? Pretty simple. Great. Now, if you go back and look at the Hebrew meaning of the word great, guess what it means? Great. Not complicated. It means great, and it also means loud. So have you ever walked into a restaurant, and there's someone in the restaurant that is so loud, that's all you can hear? Everybody ever had that happen? Just that one person you hear them overall. Think about that in a sense. God's voice, God who is above all, above everything. You hear him, we see him, we recognize him. He is great. He is the standard. Now, I started to go back and look in Psalm, and there's a couple, uh, many verses, but I want to read to you just here. Psalm 86.10 says this by David. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Psalm 96, 4. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Psalm 135, 5. For I know the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. And I started to say, well, Stacy, is there a way to kind of fathom God's greatness? Because certainly Scripture says it's unsearchable. We see right here in verse 3. But is there a way we get maybe a small taste of the size of God, how big and how great He is? And Chris, I know you'll know this from your apologetics days and, and your, your, your doctorate. But there's at least three arguments that you'll hear often about the evidence of God. One's called the cosmological argument. The second one's called the teleological argument. And the other one's called the moral argument for evidences that God exists. The teleological argument goes like this. It says, every design had a designer. The universe has a highly complex design. Therefore, the universe had a designer. In other words, God designed the, the earth. And when you look at this teleological argument, and bear with me for just a second, what it talks about is how precise the world is, the precision with which God has designed this earth. So let me give you just some examples. And this gives you a sense, a hint, of how great our God is. And this is just in designing the earth and, some, and the universe and things around it. On the earth, oxygen comprises 20% of the earth's atmosphere. Did you know that if the earth went a little bit higher than that or a little bit below that. In other words, it wasn't a constant 21%. We would suffocate and die. We would suffocate and die. 
Second one, if Jupiter were not in its current orbit, comets and asteroids would bombard the Earth. But because Jupiter in its gravitational pull, it attracts comets and asteroids from hitting the Earth. The Earth has a 23 degree tilt. If it tilted a little bit to the left or to the right, a little bit more, a little bit less, we would have extreme temperatures on Earth and we wouldn't survive. The rotation of the Earth of 24 hours, if it was a little shorter or a little bit longer, there would be wind velocities too high and the temperatures would be too high there as well and we wouldn't survive. So what am I saying? Look at the precision with which God has created just the Earth and the things around. Those are just four examples. And we talk about the greatness of God. The magnet, we, we will never be able to fathom that. And that's what David is saying here. Great is our Lord. And the reason I bring this up, there was a story of a young boy. He was standing there with his father. And he said, Dad, how big is God? And the dad said, well, son, you see that plane up in the sky? He said, yeah. He said, what do you think that plane is? How big is it? He said, well, that plane's really small. So then he took his son, put him in the car, and he drove to the airport. And he went to a hangar where a 747 was. And he brought his son up to the 747, and he said, son, how big is this plane? He said, dad, it's huge. And then he made this point. He said, God's size in your life dep depends on how close you are or how far you are to him. The closer you are to him, the greater he will be in your life. The further you are from him, the smaller he's going to be in your life. Now, he's great on his own anyway. But in terms of us being able to recognize that, the closer we are, the more we see his greatness. The further we are, the smaller he seems. So I say all that because God's greatness, when we think about the things I listed earlier, remember that fill in the blank ask you all to think about? Here's what the world will tell you. God's greatness surpasses any pain, hurt, trial, worry, sickness, doubt, Republican Party, Democratic Party. He has always been great, is great, will always be great. But don't let the world fool you into thinking God is smaller than the things you put in that blank. So often in my life, God, can you handle this? Can you deal with this pain that we're going through? Can you really get through this? And what I'm saying is that thing's bigger than you. What David's saying here. God's bigger than everything. You're like, Stacy, I get it. But here's my point for us as a congregation. Do we live that way? Am I truly saying, and I look at this right here, math problems. I was not a great student. I worked really hard to be a good student. I just want those natural kids that got it. Like I had to work really hard to get the grades I did. But I think about math class. We always learned it as an alligator. The alligator be eats the bigger number, right? So that's like a little alligator. So he's eating five's greater than three, ten's bigger than four. 120 is greater than 12. You're like, Stacy, I get it. David's saying right here, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, for all his greatness is unsearchable. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Have this in mind. He is greater. Here's your blank to fill in. And I need to hear that. I think some people here today need to hear that because of stuff you're dealing with. So if there's anything you get from this very first point, what David is doing is centering our eyes on who Jesus is. And I know this is hard to see, but let me read. So I just took the things that David said of who God is, and I want you to imagine your prayer life if this started like this. And this is what I've been doing in my life. Listing out these things. Before I go into any details of the problems I'm dealing with in my life, before I go into the stresses of my day, my afternoon, my week, my before I go into any of those things, and those are important because they're dealing with things I'm dealing with in my life, the first thing I'm trying to do now is focus on who he is. Who is he? He's great. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. He's good to all. He's merciful overall. He's faithful. He's kind. He's righteous. He's near. And all of a sudden, as I begin to put my focus on that, now I start to have a kingdom down focus. Are y'all following with me? That's when I begin to get a kingdom down focus. So number one, what David is saying is I want you to recognize who he is. He gives us six statements. And I'm going to encourage you. We're going to have some homework at the end with Psalm 145 this week, and I'll show it but about who he is and how we deal with life. So now I want to go back to those verses. Remember point number two? We said number one, who he is. And then what else David does is he says, now I'm going to tell you about what he does. And so in those 21 verses, I highlight again in yellow, and I'm just going to tell you some of the things that he says. He describes in verse four, he does mighty acts. Verse five, he does wondrous works. Verse six, awesome deeds. Verse 12, mighty deeds. He also gives us in verse 13, an everlasting kingdom, a dominion that endures. He upholds us in verse 14. Some of us need to hear that this morning. 
He upholds us. He raises us up. He opens His hand in verse 16. Satisfies our desires. Fulfills our desires in verse 19. Hears our cries in verse 19. Saves us and then He destroys. Now let me take a moment and let me share with you what I, what I believe David is doing here. And this is just me. We don't know how old David is when he wrote Psalm 145. But I believe he was older. I believe he was 50, 60 years old, later in life. He's had a bunch of experiences. And so what I think is happening here is David is reflecting on those things that he's seen happen. You're like, well, Stacy, what are those things he's seen happen? Can you give me some examples? Well, so what I did is I went back and I looked in the Old Testament, and if I put the books of the Bible in chronological order, what are some things that David would know because he's king of Israel? He's got to know the history of his people, right? So let's just look at things that would happen in the people's life of Israel. Here's some examples. Well, first, we know Genesis, the creation of the universe, the flood, the call of Abraham and the promised land promise, the story of Joseph, Moses in the burning bush, the 10 plagues, the story of Passover and sparing the Israelites, the exodus from Egypt, crossing of the Red Sea, the Ten Commandments, Joshua and the battle of Jericho. Those maybe were some of the things David is saying when he talks about mighty acts, wondrous works, awesome deeds, everlasting kingdom. I think those would be some of the things naturally he could have been referring to. But then I said, okay, well, that's the king. That's the king saying, hey, this is my people from Israel. I'm seeing what he's done, but what about my life? What about my life as King David? What have I had to go through? So now let's look. If you take that same idea that David's thinking about not just his people but himself, think about what happened in David's life where he could claim, God, these are the things you've done. He wasn't killed by Goliath. He should have been. Numerous military victories. He didn't die in battle, and it could have certainly have happened. He was anointed and became the second king of Israel. Think of all the pressures he had that mounted just to be the king of Israel. He was pursued by his enemies, even his own son, but yet he was spared and protected. There was rape and murder in his family, as we talked about earlier. And then even in David's own life, as we know, there was adultery and murder. So now look at those words on the screen and what I talked about earlier. David's feeling restoration. He's feeling loved. He's feeling the goodness of God. He's feeling like he's being upheld. He's being raised up. God's hearing his cries, and God's saving him. So what I did this morning, and what I want to share something with you is, Stacy, what about in your life? What's God doing in your life, maybe your family? I'm going to share something personal with you. This is a journal that I keep, and I know a lot of folks I've not met, so you don't know what's going on in our family, but right now my uh, mother-in-law, who I love dearly, is battling a stage four glioblastoma. And some of you know what that is. You've had, you've dealt with it. So we're in the trial of that right now. We're in that fiery furnace. And every day I'm looking to who he is and what he does. And we're praying for a miracle, but we're trusting him. Even if that doesn't happen, we're trusting his plan, his way, his time. And so what I've done through this process, and Angie, my kids know this, I've kept a journal of just different ways I've seen God work in our family since she came. She came home to be with us in July. 100% of the time they're living with us. And there's some things that I want to share with you about what I look at and say, God, how's he working in our life? Because we just heard David maybe reference some things. How's he hearing our cries? So here's what I want to tell you. The day she came home from Bella, which is on Highway 50, many of you know that's a, a care facility, we needed a van to come. We didn't have a van. Didn't know where to get a van. Carlton Daniels, with able to serve, gives us a van. Drives her to our house. Prayer answered right there. Then when we get to our house, it's supposed to storm all that day on July 18th. It's supposed to storm the whole day. When she gets to our house, guess what? It's sunny. No rain. No rain. Gets her out. We have to wheel around the front of the house. We get her locked in, set to go. Carlton goes to get back in his van, and guess what happened in his van? Breaks down in our driveway. Has to call a tow truck. And then all of a sudden, the rains pour. None of that happened when she left Bella. Imagine if she had been trapped on Highway 40 or 540 in that hot sun, raining, car didn't work. God answered a prayer there. And then Deidre, where's Deidre? Where's your hand, Deidre? Where's Deidre? I know she's in here. There you go. So let me tell you this. So the organization we're using, Deidre works for. And so we're looking for, we're all confused, not knowing what to happen. And then all of a sudden, the organization we're working with to take care of Wani, they send a caseworker manager to our house, and guess who it is? It's Deidre. Plymouth. We start to see God's hand on that. Oh, Deidre, thank you for what you did. She came in, loved on us. 
Then we needed some nurses, some CNAs. Didn't know where to go. My wife has some friends from our previous church. Here's some names. Three wonderful Christian women who are loving on her right now. Answered prayer. Now get this. We needed a chaplain. It wouldn't be my brother because he certainly could do it, but he lives a little far away, so we had to get somebody more local. We'd love to have him. He's a little far away. So, so in comes a guy named Philip. Well, Philip went to the church that my father-in-law went to when he was a teenager. And Philip was like nine years old. My father-in-law was a teenager. They knew each other. Hadn't seen each other since then. Since then. Ephesus Baptist Church in Raleigh. He walks in and they meet and they talk, find out they went to the same church. They know each other and their families. Answer prayer. I got you. I got this. That's what he was saying. And then if you want to have a little bit of Couple more examples of that. Insurance. Just working through that process. We put in a claim. We didn't think anything was going to happen. And obviously, you know, with medical expenses, it can be expensive. And we had a claim come through that really helped us when we needed it. Answered prayer. And then this was a bonus. My niece, Sadie. How old is she, Angie? Seven? Losing her teeth. Well, guess what? The CNA nurses don't just take care of Wani. They pull teeth, too. They pulled a tooth from my niece. So what am I saying here? What have we just talked about? Who God is, six things from David. What he does. We see David maybe reflecting on the history of his people, maybe reflecting in his life. And so here's what I'm asking you. Have you taken time lately to reflect on what God's doing in your life? Have you just taken a few moments and said, God, thank you? And some of you here may say, Stacey, it's been a hard, hard road. I don't know that I could really point it out. I want to encourage you. Start spending time, first of all, recognizing who he is. And guess what? You'll begin to see more clearly what he does. Because you're more attentive. Your eyes are up so you can be kingdom down. Let me close with this. These are those two points here. So I'm not going to read all that. But what he does, we just listed through a number of things of what he does from the scriptures. That's all that is is a summary. So let me go to this last part. How do we respond? So here are the 21 verses again. Just like before, I highlight in yellow how we respond. I'm not going to do all of these. I'm just going to pick a few, just a few. And I want you to listen at what David does in response. God, I'm seeing who you are. God, I'm seeing what you do. Now let me show you how I'm going to respond. And listen at some of the words he uses. Extol. Bless, praise, commend, declare, speak, pour forth, sing aloud, give thanks, make known, eyes up. You see in verse 15, call on you, fear you, love you. Like just he goes on and on that my response is this is how I'm going to respond. So let me go to verse 1. I'm just going to call out a few of these. He says this in verse 1, I will extol you. Well, if you look at that word extol in Hebrew, it is pronounced rum. I'm a southern guy. It might be pronounced better than that. But it's room. That's how it sounds. In Hebrew. That means to lift up and hold up. So what David's saying, God, I will lift you up. I will hold you up. And think about it. This is the second king of Israel. Right? He could have been filled with himself and pride and confidence. about my, No, I'm lifting you up, God. Now look at verse 2. In 1 and 2. He says, I will bless your name. That word in Hebrew is, in Hebrew is barak. And I love this. To bless means to salute, to praise. And this is what I love best. It means to kneel down. He's saying, God, I'm going to lift you up. But for me personally, I'm going to kneel down so that I can lift you up even higher. So when you see that word bless, he's saying, I'm going to lift him up. I'm going to bow to him. And then look at this last couple words. The word praise in verse 2. He says, I will bless you. In other words, kneel to you and I will praise your name. That word praise is halah in Hebrew. And it means to boast, to rave, to shine. So what he's saying, God, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to bow down on my knees and I want to put all the shine on you because of what you've done and who you are. That's what David's saying. And it's such a lesson for us in our prayer life and our walk with God. God, I want to spend time focused on who you are and what you do so that what comes out of me. And if you look in verse 7, what shall pour forth? So whatever is in me comes out of me. We should not be covert Christians, CIA Christians, 
secret service Christians. That's not who we should be. We should be ones who are willing to share and talk about what God is doing in us and what comes out of us as a way to give a testimony for Him. So here's what I want to close with, and I've got a story I want to share with you. If you want to know how God has been working in and through you lately, start with a focus on what God has done for you eternally first. And that response is the most important one. So here's what I'm saying. What's God done in my life lately? Well, here's what I'm going to say. is Before I start focusing on what God's done in my life lately, because I don't deserve any of that, I want to focus on what He's done for me eternally when He went to the cross and He died for me. If He did nothing else in my life, any miracles, any movement, any, if he did, He's already done enough. But yet I'm so focused on my stuff, I want to see how He's working, I sometimes forget to go back to the cross and say, that's where it all starts. That love He showed for me. So, here's what I want to do. These are those three things. So how we respond, I listed that out as well. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you some joy work because I don't want to call it homework. Homework sounds boring. I guess of work. When we're reading Scripture, we're looking at the Bible, that is not a duty. That is a delight that we get to do. So here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. First of all, we said today that I want you to think of that one thing or those things right now that are most consuming your thoughts. And I know these things are hard because we're dealing with it. So first thing, I want you to put that in the blank at the top. Whatever that is, whatever those things are that have you consumed where you're looking out first versus look, put that in the blank. And here's now what I want you to do. This week, I want you to take Psalm 145 and I want you to read it four times this week. And you're, you're going to ask me why four times. I'm going to tell you in just a minute. I want you to read it four times this week. And I want you to start highlighting and underlining who he is, what he does, and how we respond, just like I did today, so you can see it yourself. But why do I say four times? Well, some of you may have heard this, but not long ago there was a study done. And that study was done where they polled 40,000 people, the ages of 8 to 80. And they basically found when people engage in Scripture one time a week, which could just be coming to church and hearing a message, one time, just engaging in Scripture one time a week, there's negligible impact in areas of their life. When they open up the Scriptures and engage in it two times a week, this study found of 40,000 people ages 8 to 80, negligible impact in key areas of their life. This study then said for people who engage in Scripture three times a week, small indication that there's a pulse, that there's something that's going on if they got into the Scriptures three times a week. But then something happened when they got into the Scripture four times a week. Here's what it said. For those uh, 40,000 people that got into the Scripture four, four times a week or more, here's what happened. Loneliness, loneliness dropped 30%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40%. Alcoholism dropped 57%. Sex outside of marriage dropped 68%. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%. Viewing pornography dropped 61%. Sharing your faith jumped 200%. Discipling others jumped 230%. There was a profound difference in those who engaged in Scripture four times a week versus the distractions that the world gives us to say, look out, versus looking up first. So, Janet and Roy, you don't know this. Where are you? Right here. I, if you could see my notes right now, the song you just sang, and I'm sitting there, I got a little teary-eyed because how the Lord works in things like this. I wrote this down. When I think about eyes up, kingdom down, the old hymnal rings true. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I didn't call them before that today. I did not call them, and I heard that day, and I was like, oh boy, we're on to something here. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to close with just a couple stories, and I want to say thank you for giving me a few moments, but I want to share something that's happened in my life recently. And I want to, I want to close with this, because this is one of the most important parts of what we're talking about today. So my coaches are back there, and they know part of this story. So one of my teammates um, on my high school football team, and I was part of the 87 state championship team that won the state title, 
Um, one of my teammates became very sick earlier in January. And my teammate and I were not super close growing up, even playing together, but from January till the time he passed, we became pretty close. Myself and the coaches, we would go visit him in the hospital. But it was in March of this year, and I know there were other people who were praying for him and shared Jesus with him. I went to go visit him, and I'm not saying this because this has anything to do with Stacy Betts. That is not why I'm sharing this with you. But when we were sitting there in March in his living room, he prayed to receive Christ. He would die just a few months later, and then something else happened that I just couldn't imagine. We're at his funeral, and coaches know what I'm talking about, and I come up to speak for a minute, and I share something I'm going to share with you in just a minute. And at the end of what I shared, which is the gospel, I sat down. And the pastor comes up and starts to talk. And then my teammate right beside me, Don Smith, interrupts the pastor. Pastor, pastor, hold on a second. Can you stop for a minute? I feel the spirit moving right now. We need to see if anybody wants to come forward and accept Jesus. Stacy, why don't you come up forward with me? And I'm like, uh, okay. So we walk up front at this funeral. And we're just sitting there. And it was really quiet. And the pastor said, okay, does anybody want to come up and receive Jesus today? Just sitting there. Got really quiet. All of a sudden, whoop. Up stands a guy, comes up, walks forward, gives his life to Christ right there in the funeral. And now let me tell you what happens. His name was Josh. It was my teammate Scott. It was his nephew. We spent some time together getting to know him. He lives in Wilmington. He'd just gotten out of prison. He's had a hard life. He said, Stacy, I'm ready to come home. What's so fitting, homecoming today? I'm ready to come home. So we talk a little bit. He moves to Wilmington. We stay in touch, trying to encourage him. He had found a church there. And then I get a phone call just a few weeks ago that Josh had passed away. And I had a chance to go to his funeral and say a few words at his funeral. A man I didn't know well, but he wanted to start running his race for the kingdom and play for the head coach. And so here's what I want to tell you. This is the same thing I shared there. The most important decision you can make, number one, is if you know who Jesus Christ is. And I'll tell you the simple the way I do it. I'm an old baseball player. This is the way I love to tell the story. It's the greatest message I could ever tell you. If you think about what's the purpose of baseball, first, second, third, home, right? That's the, get around the bases and get home. Well, think of this. First base is God loves you. He has a purpose and he has a plan for your life. He loves you. Second base, sin separates me from the love, purpose, and plan God has for me. So what's on first base I can't have because the sin in my life, it separates me from God. I deserve judgment, condemnation, Separation, I don't deserve it. That's where the beauty of third base comes in. See, Jesus came, died on the cross so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have the fullness and purpose in life that we were designed to have. That love that he wants to have for us. But we got to recognize second base in order to get the first base because we got to recognize we need Jesus. But here's the problem. Did you know that there's 90 feet from first base to second, second to third? I'm going the wrong way. I'm going my way. So for, home to first, first to second, second to, it's 90 feet between the bases. But did you know that many people, in this analogy, it's 18 inches? Because what they do is they stay at third base. I know who Jesus is. I believe in what I've heard about him in church and people talk about, but they never have gone home. They've never gone home to say, I want to receive and trust Jesus. So go from third all the way home, and home is heaven. And if you think about the shape of a baseball field, and particularly the diamond, right? If you look right in the middle, it's just like a cross. And if you were to say the gospel in four words, Jesus in my place. That's the gospel in four words. So I want to just make sure anyone here who has not made that decision, who says, Stacy, I know God loves me. I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus, but I've never gone home. You can do that today. You don't have to leave here with any doubt that you've been saved. And for those of you who say, Stacey, I've made that decision. I've been at home, but it's been a struggle. It's been hard. Here's what I'm going to encourage you. Eyes up. Kingdom down. Who he is, what he does, and how we respond. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. We'll close out in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to be here at Plymouth Church. A place so special to me, and I'm so honored to be here. And I pray, God, for the message today that it has honored you and that people are drawn to you, Father, and that we will recognize how important it is that every day we spend time in your word and in your truth. 
And God, there's profound change when we do that. Your Holy Spirit it comes into us, and you begin to fill us and empower us, and you show us who you are. You show us what you do in our lives. And God, we would respond with praise and adoration and worship. So help us to follow exactly what David outlined us today. And then for anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord, that they would receive you today and just say, Lord, I love you, and I know you have a plan and a purpose for my life. Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I'm separated from you. I know you then sent Jesus to die on the cross for me and that I need to come home. And to come home, I receive him and surrender my life, confessing my sins, turning from my sins, and inviting him into my life and surrendering my life to him. So if you decide to do that, Lord, anyone here today makes that decision, they're home and they're safe. And so we praise you for loving us. Thank you for this time together. Lord, we lift it up to you now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? All right. So I am a coach who loves to recap. So what do we recap? Eyes up and what? Eyes up. Kingdom down. That's it. Who he is, what he does, and how we respond. Thank you so much. The closing hymn today is Just As I Am. Please stand as we sing. Thank you so much for being here, Brother Stacy. And I think when the Lord uh, spared his life as a kid, they thought he was going to be just scrawny and weak. And he was uh, not just the backup on that, qu- on that championship team. He was the quarterback. And he went on to play college baseball, right, for that red team. And I still invited him to come today. So that made some of you like, it, like him a lot better. So, But thank you again. I'm going to say a prayer and, uh, uh, for the, over the meal as well. And then as you go by, you can get your T-shirts if you want. We're going to give just, let's give just a minute or two for people that have children to be able to go and get their kids. And then we'll start lining up in there and, and get right to eating them and having a fellowship. Let's pray. Father God, thank you again so much for this day. Thank you for the blessing of being here in your house. Thank you for Stacy and what you're doing in his life. And just pray for the ministry he's involved in and going into all these high schools, Lord, these um, secular high schools that we're still allowed to at this point. And just proclaiming the gospel. We thank you for the conviction in his heart. We thank you for sparing his life and for what he has done with it and what he continues to, to uh, be used by you. And Lord, we're just thankful and grateful for having him today and having Plymouth Church as his home. We, in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen.